September 28, 2014 marked the beginning of the end for an era of theme park design. The Studio Backlot Tour at Disney's Hollywood Studios closed its doors, and with it came the start of a string of changes for the Walt Disney World theme park, as it would undergo a shift in focus away from the world of movie production and towards more fantastical lands. 25 years after its opening as a working movie studio, where guests could come and witness the magic of Hollywood on the East Coast, the park underwent several years of drastic changes, as many of the last remnants of the original studio theme closed for newer, different experiences. And Disney weren't alone in this, because at the same time, Universal Studios were also shedding their similar movie aesthetic for more general, hyper-immersive attractions based on their IP, as were other studio parks around the world. And it seemed like these parks, that had all sprung up across the globe together, were now asking the same question. Does anyone still care about movie studio theme parks? I want to take a look back at the trend and the eventual demise of the movie studio theme park. Their origins, their explosion in popularity, their evolution over the years, and why they were ultimately doomed to fail. The origin of the movie studio theme park lies, as you might expect, in Hollywood. As far back as 1915, Hollywood movie giant Universal had been charging admission to the general public, allowing them to watch silent movies as they were being filmed. In the following decades, this attraction began a transition to a tour of the studio, eventually evolving into a tram tour of Universal's extensive backlots by the mid-60s. The studio tour quickly became an incredibly popular Hollywood tourist attraction, giving the public the chance to view the filming locations of hundreds of famous movies, like The Psycho House and Motel, and Back to the Future's Courthouse Square. And as mentioned on this channel multiple times already, began adding several stops along the tour, no longer just authentic film sets, but now also custom-made attractions to demo special effects to visitors. And in this way, the movie studio theme park sort of emerged by accident, as the tour became more and more popular, and perhaps also encouraged by the recent success of Anaheim's Disneyland, Universal decided they would open additional exhibits for guests to see after the tour was over, like a costume exhibit, a makeup demonstration, and a western stunt show. And in 1964, they rebranded the tourist destination as Universal Studios Hollywood. Over the next few decades, several theatres were built at Universal Studios Hollywood, containing a variety of shows based on Universal movie and TV properties, and many buildings on the site's less commonly used upper lot were demolished to add more themed attractions, as little by little, the working movie studio gained its own theme park. Universal had hit on something big, a new style of theme park that capitalised on the glamour and mystery of Hollywood. But the park was still just a small supplement to their existing studio. If, Universal thought, this idea of combining a movie studio and a theme park could somehow be redone on an even larger scale, then it would be a guaranteed moneymaker. And so Universal started looking for ways to create the first ever purpose-built studio park hybrid. That was if their competitors at Disney didn't get to it first. In 1982, Universal's parent company MCA announced intentions to build a new TV and film studio in a plot of land near Orlando, Florida, just 10 miles north of Walt Disney World, which, just like in Hollywood, would include its own studio tram tour, and also several shows, rides, and other attractions. As part of their pre-planning for the potential studio, so the story goes, Universal pitched the location to several other major studios in the early 80s. One of these studios was Paramount Pictures. And let me ask you something. Who was the president of Paramount in the early 80s? I'll give you a hint. Hello, I'm Michael Eisner. And soon after becoming CEO of the Walt Disney Company in 1984, Michael Eisner announced Disney were also working on their own studio theme park in Florida. This, of course, incensed Universal, who alleged that Eisner had seen their plans and Disney had stolen them. And so the race was on to create the biggest and best movie studio theme park in the shortest time. This fight between Disney and Universal is worthy of a video in itself, and I would like to cover that story one day. But for now, the only relevant part is that in 1989, 
Disney won the theme park race as they opened Disney MGM Studios. Disney's new park contained rides, shows, and theming, all centered around Hollywood, seeking to educate the public about how movies are made. Guests could watch shows about the secrets of TV and movie effects at two opening day attractions, the Monster Sound Show, where they could help add sound effects to a movie, and Superstar Television, where they would volunteer to play a role in one of a handful of live-action TV shows that were popular at the time. In the center of the park lay the Chinese Theater, a recreation of the one in Hollywood, housing the Great Movie Ride, an e-ticket dark ride where guests could ride through many famous movie scenes recreated using audio animatronics. But most importantly at MGM Studios were the two tours that were available to guests. The first being the animation tour, teaching the basics of how Disney animation is made, followed by a walking tour through the animation department, where real Disney movies were being made right in the park. But the second, more significant tour was the backstage studio tour, a two-hour guided tour with both a walking and a tram segment through Disney's extensive Florida film studios. Guests would start on the tram as they drive past the studio's costume department and the scenic shop, where indoor sets from famous movies were on display. Then the tram would pass through Residential Street, a set containing multiple houses used in various movies and TV shows, like Ernest Saves Christmas and the TV sitcom The Golden Girls. After that, the tram pulled into Catastrophe Canyon, a demonstration of practical effects and pyrotechnics where a flash flood would occur and a tanker would explode in front of them, kind of like Disney's equivalent to all of those mini attractions on the Universal Hollywood tour. The tram would then meander through New York Street, a trademark of Hollywood backlots. This was the largest part of the backlot, several streets made to look like New York City. At the conclusion of the tram tour, guests would then be dropped off for the walking section of the tour, where they'd be invited to take part in the filming of an Ocean Storm movie scene. Then they'd be directed through a series of sound stages, where they could see demonstrations of practical effects as well as the sets of any currently shooting productions. Lastly, the tour stopped off at the post-production house for a glimpse at how films are edited, and the Walt Disney Theatre, where a selection of previews of new movies were being shown. Disney MGM Studios had managed, quite importantly, to open its doors before Universal, and was now the first movie studio of the new industry that was expected to boom in Central Florida. And it wouldn't be long before Universal would follow suit. The following summer in 1990, Universal Studios Florida opened to the public. After having been undercut, and as many will tell you, plagiarized by Disney, tourists would spot many similarities between the two parks. Universal also had a number of shows giving guests a behind the scenes look at movie production, such as the Animal Actors Show, the Phantom of the Opera Horror Makeup Show, the Murder She Wrote Mystery Theater, and Alfred Hitchcock, The Art of Making Movies. To one-up Disney, Universal Studios invited guests to ride the movies in multiple ways, with major e-ticket attractions themed to King Kong, Earthquake, E.T. and Jaws, but the most important elements to bringing Hollywood to Florida were the park's production facilities. Just like MGM and just like Universal Hollywood, the new park had its own tram tour, taking guests past sound stages and through its own New York Street backlog. And the park was the new home of Nickelodeon Studios, hosting its own sound stages for the filming of classic 90s Nick shows and the place where park guests could line up to see the taping of and take part in many Nickelodeon game shows. These two parks really began the craze of the movie studio theme park, an actual purpose-built park with movie production facilities that gave guests a glimpse into Hollywood. And the general public seemed more interested than ever in the world of the movies. A year after the opening of Universal Studios Florida, Warner Brothers decided to get in on the craze with the opening of Warner Brothers Movie World on the Gold Coast in Australia, located next to Australia's Village Roadshow Studios. Australia also became the home to Fox Studios' Backlot theme park in Sydney, next to Fox Studios. And the 90s also saw Disney planning to bring another MGM Studios park to Europe as a second gate at Disneyland Paris. But what was the deal with all these new movie studios opening around the world? Did the movie industry really just explode in the 1990s? Were tens of thousands of new TV and film jobs created? And how did these companies support the creation of three, four, or even five more Hollywoods? Well, unfortunately, 
just like most things in Hollywood, none of it was real. In the build-up to the opening of MGM Studios, local media in Orlando was abuzz with the idea that this and Universal Studios could turn the area into a Hollywood East, a new center for film and TV that would bring jobs and major movie productions to Central Florida. And Disney and Universal did heavily lean into this hype, with their respective studio tours and sound stages being big parts of their marketing campaigns. The idea that you could go to Florida and experience real movie making was the, the draw of both of these parks. To take you inside the heart of a working motion picture and television studio to watch real filmmaking in action. And if you go back and you watch the TV specials and promotional material from when these parks opened, they both heavily feature footage of filming taking place in the parks. But what films are these? Well, really, the answer is no films. And that is the first big problem with movie studio parks. They're not really movie studios. To clarify, both MGM Studios and Universal Orlando have had movies and TV shows filmed there. They are, or at least were, technically movie studios. But despite what the marketing said, unlike in Hollywood, these weren't movie studios with a theme park, but theme parks with a movie studio. And when your whole selling point is the studio element, that's never gonna end well. At MGM, those shows where guests could volunteer to play a part in a TV show, or add sound effects to a movie, were just shows. That backlot primarily served a purpose as a tour before it served a purpose as an actual backlot. Props that lined the tour were shipped in from California, and many of the houses and sets that guests saw were from productions that had already been filming in Hollywood and were relocated to Florida, sometimes only partially, just to add a sense of legitimacy to the studio. Like is the case with the house from the Golden Girls, which only shot exteriors in Florida but did everything else out west. Here's the movies that were shot at Disney MGM Studios. All of the movies that were shot at Disney MGM Studios. And when you look at this list, they're not exactly stellar productions. One of them is 1997's Tower of Terror, which of course was made at the park because it's based on the ride. And one of them is 1989's The Lottery, which is not actually a real theatrically released movie, but a three minute short film that was only ever shown inside of the park. It's clear to me that these movies were only shot at MGM to legitimize the park. And once that requirement was met, you can see that productions trailed off dramatically. The animation studio was also used for what unfortunately are best described as second rate productions. Although to the credit of the animation studio, they did end up producing some great stuff later on. For example, did you know that Lilo and Stitch was primarily animated at Disney MGM? In the case of Universal, they did have a higher production output than Disney. Mostly though, thanks to the decision to open Nickelodeon Studios, where the majority of Nickelodeon content was made during the early 90s. And they also made their fair share of TV shows and lower budget films in and around their park. The most significant probably being 1989's Parenthood. But if Disney's tram tour felt fake, Universal's was even worse. The Universal tram tour took guests on what was basically just a lap of the park. First past a variety of miscellaneous props sourced from Hollywood, then a number of blank sound stages they couldn't see into, and then onto the back lot, which at Universal was an open part of the park resulting in the tram having to trundle at slow speeds through crowds of guests, pointing out things you'll already see on the rest of your day. The idea that you could walk into these parks on any given day and watch a Hollywood production taking place was just not true. And the majority of stuff that you could watch was just for show. All of these shortcomings of the movie studio side of the movie studio theme park made them feel wholly inauthentic. And it was that inauthenticity that plagued these parks from the beginning. Guests were told they were going to see a real movie studio in Florida, and what they got felt like a cheap knockoff. It certainly didn't help as well that both parks suffered from difficult openings. Michael Eisner had rushed MGM Studios in order for Disney to beat Universal. And while guests did enjoy what was available, they also remarked that the park felt like it had very little to do. For example, 
if you include the studio tour, it had just two rides on opening day. And as time went on, the number of rides didn't go up that much, leading it to be known for many decades as a half-day park. Universal, on the other hand, while it did have more to do, couldn't keep any of it open for long enough for guests to experience. All of the major attractions at Universal Studios were constantly breaking down when the park opened, and one of them, Jaws, had to be completely closed for a multi-year renovation within its first few months. And if you want to hear about that, you can go watch my last video. But this artificial feeling wasn't the only, or even the most significant problem with the movie studio theme park. In fact, I think with that alone, they would have been fine. Both parks were pretty content with making attractions that simply mimicked movie production, and most guests were fine with that too. The bigger problem came later down the line, and it was with the way these parks were designed and themed. Similar parks continued to open around the world, like Movie Park Germany, and a new Warner Brothers park in Spain. And I think the reason why all of these companies loved making parks with this theme was pretty simple. They were cheap. Naturally, a Hollywood facade of a city street is much cheaper and simpler to make than a realistic city street. And you can get away with cutting a lot of corners because that's how it's done in Hollywood. But this cheaping out on theme park design couldn't go on forever. And it was only a matter of time before someone would take it too far. In 2002, Disney opened its second gate at Disneyland Paris, Walt Disney Studios. Originally meant to be an MGM Studios Europe, the park plans had been continuously scaled back due to financial restraints from a disastrous opening of the main Disneyland Paris park. And it showed. If you want to hear the full story of Walt Disney Studios, I already have a video covering it in its entirety on my channel. But to summarize, Disney had fully embraced the exposed Hollywood facade look of the Florida backlots and had expanded it to an entire park, creating a tacky, underwhelming experience of 2D backdrops and large, bland warehouses. The new park's backlot tour was even more disappointing and even faker than MGM's. And in my opinion, Walt Disney Studios was, and is, the very worst Disney theme park Ever. And around this time, the cracks were starting to show on studio theme parks worldwide. Once the novelty of the theme wore off, they just looked cheap. Especially with the opening of beautifully designed theme parks like Animal Kingdom in 1998. And it wouldn't be long before Disney and Universal took steps to try and salvage their Hollywood theme. Disney's first step away from a studio in Florida was the removal of many of the working studio elements at MGM. A lot of this stuff had already gone away soon into the park's lifespan, after a failure to entice Hollywood productions over to the East Coast. Parts of New York Street had been opened up to guests within just a few months of the park's opening, and before the end of 1990, the majority of the area was removed from the tour and pedestrianised, as new attractions were built into the existing area. And in 1991, the studio tour was split up into separate experiences for the walking and tram sections. The area outside the indoor sound stages would also be pedestrianised around this time, and named Mickey Avenue. And in 2003, the residential street was demolished, eventually being replaced by Lights Motors Action Extreme Stunt Show. Brought over from Paris, and an attempt to give guests a more exciting glimpse into movie making than the now tired tour. The Florida Animation Unit would also be closed in 2004, with the existing attraction, The Magic of Disney Animation, being modified accordingly, and the animation facilities instead occasionally being used to create artwork that would be sold in the parks. At Universal, their backlot tour had already disappeared in 1995, and in 2005, the Nickelodeon Studios closed its doors, as most productions had already moved back to Hollywood at the new Nick on Sunset. Alongside closing a lot of their production facilities, Disney also started to focus more on building attractions themed to Hollywood more broadly than specifically the clinical production side of things, hoping this could revitalize MGM Studios. Sunset Boulevard was a large expansion to the park, housing rock and roller coaster starring Aerosmith, and the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror. Universal focused less on their studios and more on their movies, and when it came time to open a second gate in 1999, they opted for their new park, Islands of Adventure, 
to be more about creating immersive fantasy worlds with killer attractions than stale backlots. In 2008, Disney ended its licensing agreement with the film company MGM, renaming their park to Hollywood Studios and replacing the soundstage buildings once part of the backlot tour with Pixar Place and the ride Toy Story Midway Mania. And a few years later, the focus of Hollywood Studios was officially shifted away from movie making to a broader world of the movies theme. In the 2010s, the global trend for theme parks firmly shifted towards this idea of creating deeply immersive fantasy worlds, with the opening of places like the Wizarding World of Harry Potter at Universal and Disney's Pandora World of Avatar. The last remnants of the Backlot Tour were eventually demolished alongside the iconic Earful Tower around 2015 to make way for Toy Story Land. And finally, Hollywood Studios put the studio theme to rest when Lights, Motors, Action and the Streets of America were closed in 2016 and replaced by Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, one of the biggest and most impressive theme park expansions in Disney history. While a lot of the other studio parks couldn't necessarily afford the massive changes that Disney and Universal could, they were also affected by this move away from the studio theme. Fox Studios' backlot in Australia closed all the way back in 2001. Parks like Warner Brothers Movie World, Movie Park Germany and Park Warner Spain chose to focus more generally on movie IP than filmmaking. And even though in the late 2010s, after these changes had been made, there were movie theme parks opening in the United Arab Emirates, these two were also more generally movie IP theme parks rather than studios. The death of the movie studio theme park was inevitable. There was no way these parks were going to realistically be able to operate a working studio and all the difficulties that comes with alongside noisy crowds shuffling past them multiple times a day. The only park that can do this is Universal Studios Hollywood. And that's only because there's actually quite a stark separation between the park and the studio, with most of the studio elements being down in the valley away from the guests and the tour avoiding areas where actual shooting is taking place. For example, when I went on the studio tour in Hollywood, I was so excited to see Courthouse Square and we didn't go on it because they were filming there. And so without that authenticity I've been talking about, they were always going to be doomed to being a lesser version of what they were trying to compete against. And when you strip away any of the real parts, you expose how cheap and unimpressive the remaining attractions look. To Disney and Universal's credit, I don't think the Hollywood East thing was done entirely in bad faith. Universal actually still sometimes shoots things in the sound stages behind Hollywood Rip Ride Rocket, the last production being a Bollywood movie in 2018. But they had to have known that what they were making was not what they were advertising, and what they were advertising was never going to last. And without new productions that guests actually cared about coming into the parks, there was nothing new to keep the studio elements fresh and interesting. And so the warehouses and painted backdrops of the theme just got old and oversaturated. This may be a bit of a stretch, but I also think that maybe the modern era of digital cameras and later YouTube and the internet removed a lot of the magic that came with these studios. And so once people were able to do a lot of this filmmaking to some extent by themselves, they didn't really care as much about seeing how a movie was made. You know, despite all of the complete roasting I'm doing of movie studio parks, I never hated them in their entirety. I think I mentioned this in my Walt Disney Studios video, but I love movie making as a whole, and I think backlots are really cool. And so, personally, I did enjoy that element at least a little bit, but I also found that they were getting incredibly overdone, and when you look more critically at them, they're so samey and bland. Not every theme park needs a New York street, and I much prefer the new era of theme park design we're in now, where the focus has shifted to creating more complete, immersive worlds. What do you think about the era of the movie studio theme park? Do you think its demise was inevitable? Do you think it could have been saved? Let me know your opinion. And if you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing, as there's a lot of other theme park content coming in the future. Other than that, if there's anything else you'd like me to cover in the future, please let me know. And as always, I'll see you next time.